Uh, hey, I'm really excited about our speaker today. Uh, I just got into town really, really late last night from a training, and so I knew I was n just not going to have time and be totally shot by the time I got here. Although I am an extrovert, so my energy is up because I'm with you guys, and I'm excited to be here today. Uh, but I'm really grateful we've got some quality folks in the in-house uh, that preach from time to time for me, and so one of them is going to cover the pulpit this morning. So will you please welcome to the stage my friend, somebody who loves the Word and loves the Lord much, Robert Montgomery. <laughs> Are we there? Are we there? Good. Can you hear me? It doesn't feel like it's on to me. Is it on? Is it on? All right. There we go. I'm sleepy, so forgive me. How are everybody doing today? Good. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Do you really believe that? <laughs> I have to ask myself. I'm up here. I'm like, do I really believe that? You know what I'm saying? Well, we've been looking at um, the Sermon on the Mount, as Son uh, talked about, and uh, we come to the section uh, where we're going to be looking at prayer and fasting. So today, what we're going to do is we're just going to jump in. Uh, I'm going to read the Word, and then we'll jump into the message. So if you can stand with me for the reading of the text. We're starting in verse 5. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut the doors and pray to your father who sees in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles since they imagine that they will be heard, they imagine that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us into, into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For it is, for it is you for if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your offenses. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. For they make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who sees in secret. Or who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Amen. You may be seated. That was a lot to read. I, I said earlier in, my, uh, in the first service, you know, I got a public school education. So reading those le uh, long passages are a little difficult at times. But like I said, we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is known as Jesus' Kingdom Manifesto. And the thing that, you know, I want you to really think about and understand as we look at this passage of Scripture from the perspective of this lens is that Jesus is literally the eternal King. And like I said, to me, it is always mind-blowing to, to realize that in the context of that day and time, the people were living and witnessing God in the flesh. So imagine, as a new disciple or a convert or, uh, you know, a Jew or a Pharisee or um, scribe, you were literally confronting the living God. You were in his presence, whether you knew it or not. Most didn't know it. They were curious to who he was. He didn't act like everybody else. He challenged the traditions of the day. He challenged the scribes. But they were literally dealing with the eternal king. He's God in human form, bringing a revolution. Jesus came to bring a revolution. He's declaring to his disciples how they should live as a part of the kingdom. 
In this sermon, Jesus was teaching his disciples about true righteousness, which is an expression of true and authentic worship. The religious leaders of the day were concerned about external righteousness. They wanted to look good, right? So the things that they were most concerned about is how they looked in front of people. I'm sure nobody in here ever does that, right? I, I relate to that, right? Who doesn't want to look good to other people? But the problem is, is when that becomes your aim or your goal, no desire to please God, they were looking for applause and praise from the people, and they had set themselves up to be pillars in the community, so everybody looked to them. So they wanted praise. The religious leader of the day were concerned about external righteousness and traditions that took precedence over the law of God. Jesus radically opposed the man-made traditions and was setting the record straight on what really pleased the Father, teaching how true righteousness must be applied in everyday life. Jesus taught his disciples how to give, how to pray, and how to fast. I want to read something that talks a little more in depth about this from uh, GodQuestions.org about the Pharisees and Sadducees, excuse me, uh, scribes. You can throw the Sadducees in there too if you want to. <laughs> but it says, Jew, the Jews became increasingly known as the people of the book because of their faithful study of the Scripture particularly the law and how it should be followed. In the New Testament era, scribes were often associated with the sect of the Pharisees. Although not all Pharisees were scribes, they were teachers of the people and interpreters of the law. They were widely respected by the community because of their knowledge, dedication, and outward appearance of the law keeping. The scribes went beyond the interpretation of Scripture, however, and added many mad main traditions to what God had said. They became professionals at spelling out the letter of the law while ignoring the spirit behind it. Things became so bad that the, re that the regulations and traditions the scribes added to the law were considered more important than the law itself. This led to many confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees and the scribe. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shocked his audience by declaring the righteousness of the scribes was not enough for, it, for them to get into heaven. A large portion of Jesus' sermon dealt with that, dealt with what people had been taught by the scribes and what God actually wanted. Toward the end of Jesus' ministry, he thoroughly condemned the scribes for their hypocrisy. They knew the law and they taught it to others, but they did not obey it. So just think about it. In that day, these were the religious leaders. They were people like me and Sean that are teaching the Word of God, right? They're up front, and they're teaching people how they should give, how they should pray, how they should fast, but they were doing it for praise. They were doing it for applause. Ultimately, they were self-righteous, and God opposes that. Jesus opposes that. So what he was doing was revolutionary in his time. He was bringing a revolution. He was setting the record straight teaching them on how they are really to pray, how they are really to fast, right? So reading this to me, reading this, this history of the Jews and understanding that is it's convicting. James 4, 17 says, so it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. And so we as people, can you relate to that, right? You ever see any self-righteous motives in you? I know I see them at times in me. Right? Where I'm more concerned about how I look as opposed to doing the bidding of God, to walking right before God. Authentic, real worship is what favors the heart of God. Just like Jesus challenged the scribes and the Pharisees, he's challenging our religiosity today. I talked about traditions in the last service. I made a point to point out, right? We have our traditions, especially as we're going to church. The, the way we do our services, you know, it becomes a kind of a tradition. There's nothing necessarily wrong or right about how we do things, you know, in the sense of how we set up our building, what song comes first, when the pastor comes up, right, our setting, right? All of these things we get comfortable with and they become the norms. They become our traditions and we, you know, um, get, can get so attached to these things that they can take precedence over the Word of God. I mentioned before, one of the, a small thing, but really not so small, 
in, in reality is I was so used to doing uh, communion every month that the idea of doing it every week just didn't make sense to me. It, it, it annoyed me. So I, I was annoyed because we did communion every week. Breach took the high ground to be more holy, and I was upset about it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I mean, but really, something that silly and stupid, right? But imagine the traditions in that day. And so what we have to be careful of is allowing these trappings to be the things that we focus on as opposed to bringing pleasure to God and the concerns of our brothers and sisters in the pews because we are a body coming together to worship. This is the, the epicenter for worship where we are to learn about God, grow in him, to live in relationship with him, right? In this chapter, verses 5 through 18, Jesus is retraining the people because what they've been looking at has been bad. The teaching they have been getting didn't have any power behind it because it lacked authenticity. The hearts of the men who were leading were wrong. The heart is the barometer of worship. Albert Moeller in his book, The Prayer That Turned the World Upside Down, said, we could pursue the glory of the Father by humbling ourselves in secret, or we could pursue our own glory by exalting ourselves before others. We simply can't do both. So self-righteousness is a problem. It was a problem for the Pharisees in that time. It's a problem for us today. So the question is, how do we combat this self-righteous issue that we find ourselves plagued with? Jesus gave two tools for us to combat this. Prayer and fasting. These are the tools that God has given that he is re-explaining to his disciples that are at their disposal for them to utilize to not be self-righteous. So if you're wondering if you can overcome your sin struggle or your self-righteous struggle today, the answer is unequivocally yes. Let me pray. Father God, I come to you this morning. I just thank you that you are so good to us. We don't even understand the depths of your goodness. But I pray you will give us a glimpse today that you would illuminate your word to us, that you would teach us this morning, that you would draw near to us, Lord God, as we draw near to you, that you would speak through me, Lord God, that you would have the freedom to say whatever you wish to whomever you wish. Lord, that your words would go as you designed them to that the words I speak would be your words, Father, that you would speak to every aching heart, Lord, that you would speak to every need, every person in here this morning, every person under the sound of my voice, Lord God, would hear from you directly today. We give you praise and thanks for being good. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Jesus starts out in verse 5, talking to his disciples on how they should not pray. <laughs> That's an interesting way to start off, right? I mean, I don't know, I don't think I would have started it off. If I'm teaching something, I wouldn't have started it off going how not to pray, but he goes right directly straight line toward the, the self-righteous self -righteous behaviors in this setting. I mean, imagine if you were a Pharisee um, or a scribe there, I, they had to be fuming with rage if they were present. He goes in and says, hey, and he calls them out by name. Don't pray like, what, what does he say? How does he say it right here? In verse uh, 5, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by the people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. reward. And then if you go back further to chapter, uh, in the beginning of the verse, chapter, in, in verse 1, he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with the Father in heaven. 
Then if you go over to chapter 5, verse 20, he says this, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you would not get into the kingdom of heaven. So he goes straight for the jugular. Right? There's no beating around the bush with him. Straight up. You ain't going to get in heaven if your righteousness does not surpass your leaders, your teachers, those who've been teaching you how to walk with him, God. <laughs> you know, with, with, the, with Jesus, the incarnate son of God, with the father, right? I mean, it's a pretty mind-blowing thing that he does. But as you look at this verse a little further, you see the first thing when he says, whenever you pray, is that, you know, he expects us to pray. It is assumed in this passage, right? Prayer is a fundamental pillar for us as believers. Jesus is making this point right there, right? He's telling them how not to pray, but he assumes that we're praying as his children, as disciples, as believers. We're praying. We're actively seeking God. To not pray is to not have a spiritual life or to have a weak spiritual life, okay? Like if prayer is not a part of your life, then you're missing the most vital part of your relationship with God because that's why you, how you converse. That's how you communicate with the Lord is through prayer. Jesus instructs his disciples how not to pray. Then he goes on. He says, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street quarters to be seen by the people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. So the question we already talked about is who are the, who's the hypocrites? We know that it's the uh, Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus hated their piety. They did everything for the applause of the people. Their motives were not for God. But they love their traditions. They love their getting praise. Question. What are your motives like? As you sit here today in this pew or chairs, what's your motive as it relates to God and what he's doing in your life? Where, where are you? It's a question I've been asking myself all week. And you know, the funny thing is, I've had so many opportunities, opportunities throughout this week, really throughout this month and every other day, to demonstrate where my, where my heart is at. Motive gets down to the heart of the matter. You see, prayer is what's reflected deep down. It's where you're really at. It's a heart posture. That's what God is concerned with. And so, Throughout all the circumstances and things that rise its head, it demonstrates where your heart is. I can't tell you how many times I've had to go back and think about where I'm at in the moment. Whether it's I'm getting frustrated, I lose my temper, I get angry, problems occur, whatever it might be. But every th single situation, every single thing, my responses is a demonstration to where my heart is in the moment. So where's your heart? I think a lot of us, when we read these scriptures, sometimes we read it removed from ourselves, right? We look at the Pharisees, we look at the scribes, and we don't necessarily see ourselves in them, right? But Jesus is challenging us just like he challenged them. Jesus said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. I like the way uh, late pastor and Bible teacher Warren Wisby described a hypocrite. He said, a hypocrite is not a person who falls short of his high ideals or who occasionally sins because, of his, because, of, because all of us experience these failures. A hypocrite deliberately uses religion to cover up his sins and promote his own gains. Right? That's what a hypocrite does. It's all about self-promotion. Right? It's that person who is going through problems, but not really being truthful about what he's dealing with, and then putting on a mask. In fact, hypocrite means an actor who wears a mask. 
They're, they're concerned about their own gains, what brings them glory, what brings them recognition. So secret, secret, not so secret, is if our eyes are consistently inward focused, there's no way that we're concerned about giving God praise. We're looking for our own glory. No way around it. No matter how you slice it, you can throw it up in any which direction. It's going to always tandem out to self-righteousness in behavior. It has to because that's the very nature of sin. The root of it is separation from God. It is seeking your own will above God's. Even when I'm trying to correct somebody that may be doing something wrong, the Bible tells us to be careful how we correct a brother and sister because if I'm correcting them from a standpoint that I'm above them and I don't understand sin and I don't have any empathy, I'm just a self-righteous jerk in that moment, right? Again, we got to keep it in context. In that moment, that's not who we are as believers because of the blood that was shed for us and the identity we have in Christ. But if we're not walking in righteousness and right, right uh, relationship, this is what expressed out of our life. And this is a consistent thing, guys. We're consistently having to correct course in our walk with God. So if you think you're just on the straight and narrow and you're not ebbing and flowing in and out of these things, then you, you're worse off than you realize. And that's me, by the way. Sometimes it's hard for me to see my own sin. I'm going to give you a story I haven't really ever shared before. It's a disgusting story. I was in a relationship and I wasn't honoring in that relationship. But I was acting in, other, in front of other people like I was walking with the Lord. But the way I was behaving was not such. I was working at this warehouse and every day this guy would come in and bring water and we we converse and talk. And come to find out he was a believer. And, you know, we're talking. And he's telling me about a situation. He meets someone. He knows someone. And, you know, as I'm listening to the story, it's a girl. I'm, I'm warning him, you know, about how to have this relationship with this girl. Right? I'm being... Spiritual brother, big brother, giving some spiritual advice on how to handle yourself in these kind of relationships. But as I got to know the situation a little, a little more, what God started to show me is that this brother was talking about the person I was in a relationship with. And he had been telling me about this guy that this girl was into who wasn't walking right and wasn't leading her right. I just didn't know that the guy that he was talking about was me. So God had me in a situation where God is, is, is talking about a situation which is actually me. I'm the guy. I'm giving him advice about me. You're talking about a disgusting story. Now, praise God, I didn't stay there. I moved on. I got out of it. But, man, I thought I was being holy and righteous, being a brother and encouraging this brother. But God was slapping me in the face. My own sin. I wish I could say that was the only time that happened. It's kind of like the donkey talking to Balaam. God just might use you to talk to you. It 
embarrasses me, quite honestly. But I'm not embarrassed anymore to the point that I'm, I'm like, that's where I was at, right? That's where I was. I was living in self-righteousness, right? Being a hypocrite. Jesus said, when you pray, don't be like that. They love to be seen. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. Scripture says, what does it profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul? We must be careful not to allow a pretense of holiness to replace a life of true godliness. Guys, the the truth is, look, this is a wrestle because we are living in the flesh. We wrestle with the flesh, right? I mean, this, this is a part of what it means in this life to struggle and walk with God because we're born again, we have a new nature, the spirit lives within us, we have access to God, but we have to maintain a disciplined life in order to carry it out. And it's a meticulous, intentional pursuit, right? And, the, and, the, and, and things in life and stuff happens. It's your life is really not on your own time frame. And it's hard for us to grasp that. When we think we're walking at time God shows us, we're not. And he puts a check. Check yourself. But that's mercy. That's God's mercy. That's God's grace. That's God's love. He's not done away with us. He's not through with us. He doesn't throw us away. He corrects us. He restores us. He transforms us. He renews us. He shifts our focus back to what is good. And he's the only thing that's good. Period. We must be careful not to allow a pretense of holiness to replace a life of true godliness. Verse 7, but when we pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. I like the way the, uh, the NLT reads. It says, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. God, here's the, the good news. Is that in this struggle... When we just take a minute before we respond, as we're dealing with situations, when we are, you know, on the verge of losing control, learning to redirect ourselves. And, when I, and this is the hard thing for me to understand, the difference between the spirit and the flesh. You know, we have these built-in responses and inclinations based on how we grew up and who we were and how we identified in life. These responses just, ah, they just come, you know? I mean, I, I, I have so many of them, I'm like, it's hard to stop them because they're natural for me. Like, I grew up as, look, you're not going to do certain things to me. You're not going to disrespect me. So when that comes, my, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to respond to that disrespect, right? I'm going to challenge this, and I feel justified. But the truth is, I am being self-righteous, in those moments. We're being self-righteous when we don't check the flesh, when we don't pause, run, get away, whatever we need so that we don't allow that to uh, express itself. Because that's what Satan is trying to get, glory out of our life. And then once we recognize, even when we fail or if we fail, we just go back and say, forgive me, God, get up. Fill me with your spirit. Help me. Uh, Hey, I'm sorry. I screwed up. I was being self-righteous. It's the most difficult thing in the face of the world at times. Prayer is meant to build our life up, right? Prayer in the most basic sense, like I said earlier, is talking with God. It's having a conversation with God. I've really been trying to wrap my brain around this. Like, really, as I've been walking through this week, even as I struggle to carry these things out, asking myself every single moment, have I been talking to God? 
God, okay, let me sit down. Really, you're listening to me. You're right here. God, you asked me to bring this message. I have no idea how to bring it. I, I feel driven and torn in many different directions. And just talking to him, and what I started to notice is like, yeah, I'm failing, but I'm recovering quicker. Right? Like I'm going off, but I'm like, okay, shoot. But I'm trying to mentally take it in. Right? And this is a challenge. I want you to think about this. Mentally take it in that God is available for you every single second of your life. Man, it's just, it's just so true. Jesus is correcting their vision, their lenses, their eyes. See, this is what happens when we pray. When we are just looking from our own perspective, we can't see the landscape. But when we pray, it brings us up high. We can look down and see the real issue. We can see the enemy behind the scenes causing havoc trying to bring division, trying to bring destruction, trying to undermine the work that the Spirit of the Lord is doing. Ugh, we can just latch on to that. Jesus is correcting their vision and monitoring them to cultivate their relationship with the Father in heaven. God is pleading with us to cultivate our lives on the truth, to spend time with him, to relish those disciplines of prayer, fasting. It is impossible for us to manufacture the kind of righteousness that the Lord requires. We must build our life on authentic, conversation and communication with God. So when he says, go in your private room, in other words, seek God, look for him in every moment of your day. Prayer is the one thing you can do all day while doing something else. Literally. It's the one thing you can do all day while you're doing all these other tasks. My wife does this a lot. She prays while she's doing this. She's praying. She's praying for that. She's praying. She does it a lot, consistently praying for things while she's doing things. It's the one thing we can consistently do while doing other things. Verse 7 and 8, when you pray, don't be like the Gentiles since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask. Again, Gentiles, unbelievers, God doesn't even hear the prayer except the prayer of repentance. God hears the prayers of his faithful servants, of his children. We don't emulate the world. We demonstrate to them what it really looks like. See, this world, again, tells us God doesn't exist. In fact, they think we're prideful and arrogant to say that he does. Right? But what does it matter that they don't see doesn't change the reality of who God is. He's here for us. He sees us. He says, don't babble like the Gentiles, but to know with certain that, certainty that God sees us and hears us. I want to share a story with you of God seeing us and God listening to our prayers. I was at Starbucks one day studying the Word, and had a new Bible, and, I'm, you know, I'm just sitting down studying. Guy walks in, he sees the Bible, and he's like, hey, how you, you know, just starts talking to me. And he asked me about my Bible, and he's like, man, it's pretty cool. Can I check it out? I said, yes. You know, I give him the Bible. He's flipping through it, right? And then he turns to a spot where I had written something down. And then he reads what I wrote down, and he said to me, why did you write this? And I said, I don't remember. In fact, I think I wrote it that day. And he told me, he said, I've been praying for months 
about a concern or issue he had or a decision he had to make. And this was his answer. I was like, he's, this is the answer I've been looking for. I was blown away. God sees us, saints. There's no prayer, there's no concern that you have that God is not aware of. And God doesn't have provisions to speak to you about. Now listen to me. That doesn't mean that God's going to give you what you want. But God will do one or two things. He'll either answer it and provide for you in the way that you need, in the way that you expect, or he'll settle your heart in the midst of the situation to be able to accept the thing that he wills. You see? Because it is about his will. Verse 9 through 14. Therefore you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive us, if you forgive others their offense, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your, your offenses. The first petition in the Lord's Prayer is that the Father's name be honored. He's the sinner of it all. We exist in him. It's about God, him being honored, the Father being honored. Jesus gave his disciples a pattern to pray. So my mom, she's a proponent. She, I prayed the Lord's prayer, right? And I, I always laugh. I'm like, it's perfectly okay to pray the Lord's prayer. But the idea is it's a pattern of how we should be praying. Right? That's how we should be praying. It is a recipe of how we should pray. He says to pray like this with no vain repetitions in the Lord's name, the Lord's kingdom, the Lord's will, the Lord's bread and provision, the Lord's provision. As you see, it's all about him. He provides it all. He provides it all. It's his kingdom. It's his will. It's his bread. He's the one that forgives. His name be exalted. Therefore, you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Notice Jesus begins with our. I want to read something in a little different way. I want to, to emphasize the pronouns in this passage here. It says... Therefore, you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's just a reminder. He starts there. It's not just about us. It's the community that God emphasizes here. The community of believers. The church in which he's establishing in these very moments. This is corporate, not individual. It's a reminder we're a part of the community of believers. Second point I want to make is that we are invited to address the father like a child approaching his dad with a need, with reverence and respect. You see, he invites us to approach him. There's freedom and openness. I love the way Pastor Chuck Swindoll phrases it. He stoops down to hear our heartfelt prayers. So the posture is not God is above us listening to us cry out, oh, and he's just, he stoops down. You know, they teach us, and this is something I have to remember because sometimes I don't do it. I get mad at my kids for what they're doing, and I'm like, I told you, I told you. It's like, that's the wrong posture. I got to get down. 
and talk eye to eye with my sons. That's what God does for us. He gets down. He stoops down to our level. And he converses with us. He invites us into this kind of relationship. And I picture him giving them a hug in the process. Come here. Because this is what I do when I do get them to come. Like my sons <laughs> get upset because I always ask them, come here. Come here. When I want to uh, discipline them, I like to have them in my arms and talk to them. And they're like, I'm over here. I'm like, no, I want you over here. Come here. And they're like, why do you always do that, Dad? Because I want them to feel the connection and love that I have for them. That my words, although they might be harsh, they're not meant to break them. They're meant to mold them. They're meant to edify them and teach them. That's God's posture toward us. He stoops down. The imagery is something that I want you to, to just let sink into your brain. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The second petition in this pattern of prayer is that Jesus is about the Father's, said it, pray about the kingdom, the Father's kingdom, and the Father's will be done on earth. It's not about our kingdom, our will, it's about his will. So this is, you know, I, sometimes you pray with people. I don't know if you do this and you listen to their prayers. And a lot of times when I listen to people pray, I can get an idea of their theology, of what they believe. Because it, they express it. And sometimes it's just a mistake in verbiage. But oftentimes as I get to know them a little bit, it's, it's a way of them perceiving and believing. That's off. It, it's it's self-focused. It's not really seeking God in the situation. It's seeking their need to be met by any means. Right? But what he said, what God is saying, what Jesus is pointing us back to, that is about the Father. Is it about his kingdom? It's about his will. Ultimately, in prayer, we're seeking God to show us what he's doing and to line our lives up with his will, whether good or bad. That's the, that's the other part, right? I'm not saying we're praying for bad things to happen, but if God is allowing it, then God, in our pursuit of seeking him, will get our hearts in a place to be able to see what he's doing and to be okay and find joy. Because you cannot connect with God and not find it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you that you're not going to have those moments where you are just downright struggling with God and what's going on. I, I'm not trying to minimize any struggle that you're going through and telling you that you shouldn't have the experience and feelings. We're people. We're, those are real emotions. It's, it hurts. It's real life. And life sometimes is just hard. And there is no explanation all the time from our vantage point. But the promise that I believe God gives us as we pray in his name, as we seek his kingdom, is that when we truly burden and release to the God who's down on one knee listening, he will supply what we need for the moment. I've heard stories. I've heard stories of people lose loved ones. And God, God filled them with joy and praise. I've, I've heard a story, I had, you know, one of my uh, old mentors, Freddie Cantrell, who's now dead, wife divorced him for her boss. They got married. And, and, and Freddie was the kind of guy that, that was a hunter. If he wanted to kill you, he, he was an expert at how to do it. You know what I'm saying? But he was angry. At the betrayal, rightfully so. But he exercised forgiveness and God took it away. So much so that he became their marriage counselor. 
And then shortly after, the guy died. I think God gave his judgment on that. So the question is, what is the Lord's will? And the answer is, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. You want to know God's will? Seek his kingdom. Seek his righteousness. Get to know him through the word. You don't have to spend a lot of wasted time. God, what do you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying don't pray that. But what I'm saying is, seek him. Get busy in the scriptures communicating with God, and God is going to direct your steps. All right? God is going to direct you. God's going to move you. You may not understand all the pieces, but God will work those things out. Because ultimately, he's the one who has the ability to, and who's putting you in those situations for his glory. So when we pray, we ought to recognize God sees us in every situation. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. This is a recognition that God, this is a recognition that we need God to meet our need, both physical and spiritual. So Jesus Christ is the bread of life. But he also is the one that makes it to where we are able to provide for our families, right? This is the thing that I think sometimes we overlook. Like we can work hard at doing well and getting promotions, but ultimately our provision comes from God because he can close the door at any moment on any situation you're in. Right now you could be making $150,000, $170,000 annually, $200,000, whatever, a decent good salary. And God can take it away. Circumstances come and just wash it away. And you can find yourself in deep need. All of your investments in stock go up the, in flames. And now you're wondering how you're going to pay the mortgage. He's the one to provide. Focus is Jesus. Verse 12 through 15 and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us into, temp into tempta temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive you. See, when God forgives, he no longer credits sin to your account. This is straight gospel. See, the good news is that we're sinners. I mean, bad news. Bad news is that we're sinners. The good news is that we're saved by grace. It's not on our merit. It's on the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice. He took sin on himself. So if you're in the house today and you don't know Jesus, there's good news for you. You can be a part of this family where God is right now stooping down, asking you to come, bidding you to come. It's a reminder that our salvation is by grace, through faith alone. And so as believers, we're in position to deposit light and hope into people's lives. So some of us are dealing with forgiveness issues which means you're dealing with a trust in God issue. So God is at the throne saying, trust me. There's no magic formula to letting it go. I wish I could say that because I find there's areas that I, I same thing in my life. You know, I don't know my father, never met him a day in my life. And I, I don't know to, the, to what impact that impacted me, <laughs> to what impact that impacted me, to what measure, right? But I do know there's a part of me deep down that doesn't think he deserves forgiveness. I wrestle with that. I've had somebody once tell me, you need to, well, my kids told me this, <laughs> right? You need, to, you need to find your dad. They were kind of upset with me that I didn't, I'm not looking for him. And I'm pushing back like, well, wait a minute. He left me. I didn't leave him. 
you know? So I'm like, there's, there's something there that I'm like, I'm wrestling with. Like, but, because he deserves forgiveness, right? Because a person who doesn't receive forgiveness doesn't experience the true meaning of life. They don't experience God. I mean, it's a tough concept. Some of us have been abused. I've been abused physically, right? Not easy to say. The first time I mentioned it came out while I was teaching, and I tried to catch those words. But those abusers need forgiveness. That doesn't mean they don't need to be held accountable. My son, when he was a little boy, was abused by a teacher physically. Now, we were dealing with the issue, but we didn't know to the extent of what happened. Until as of late, he started being able to tell me, you know, some of the things that were done. As he got older, he's processing through it. I can tell you right now, I want to hurt that lady. That fact. Everything in me is angry. You know, grabbing him by the hair as he's a little boy. But she needs forgiveness. She's going to hell if she don't know Jesus. This is not even where I wanted to go. But she needs forgiveness. God waits to forgive anyone who repents. And as his children... God is telling us we don't carry the burden, we give it to him. Because he has enough to supply us what we need to get through it. Anything you can imagine. Verse 15 through 18. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like you hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put on oil, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your fasting, but to your father who's in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, you know, the Lord doesn't command us to fast. Right? It's not like prayer. Prayer is a command. We're commanded to fast. Uh, to uh, pray. We have fans and butts about it. But fasting is not a command. But nevertheless, it is good and beneficial for us as believers. And see, we got to bring it back. In this time, they were using things like their giving and their prayer and fasting as things to adorn themselves with self-worship from people. They wanted to look gloomy, to look holy before men. But they didn't have a true heart posture to know God or fast. Fasting is essentially giving up food or something else for a period of time in order to focus your thoughts on God. Fasting is an act of drawing near to God. It's saying, look, I need you, God. I need something extra. Right? It's, it's an awareness like, I'm willing to give up food, Lord, to hear you better. I, I, I'm going to set this aside, Lord, because I want, I want you more. It's showing God your commitment to him, your willingness to listen to him, to draw near to him. Fasting is a quote, but I don't know who, who wrote it. Fasting is a separation from many things in order to give deliberate and total attention to prayer. Say that one more time. Fasting is a separation from many things in order to give deliberate and total attention to prayer. I've become a a proponent of fasting, right? I've, 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 I've fasted, you know, quite honestly, the reason why I fasted is my uncle practiced it as a discipline. I witnessed him do it. Second, I heard Pastor Steve Farrar mention in a message one day that was so impactful to me. I think he was doing Promise Keepers. 
he talked about the struggle he was having with his son. And he didn't know what was going on. He noticed a shift in behavior, but he couldn't figure out what to do and he didn't know how to get through to his son. So as opposed to rushing and bombarding his son, he committed to prayer and fasting. And God broke his son down and demonstrated his love to his son and dealt with the situation. And that just spoke volumes to me. It just spoke volumes. When he said that, I said, whoa. There was no, let me go figure this out. He, I, 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 God, I'm going straight to you. So much so, I'm going to give this up because I need to hear it from my son. There was no false motives there. There was no pretense there. There was out of genuine concern for his son. You see, I want to close want us to kind of reframe how we look at prayer. Because most of us, or at least I'll say I, and I think a lot of people are like me, when we think of prayer, I think we naturally feel like it's boring (laughs) or it's work, it's hard. And we kind of look at it as though it's our efforts to pursue God. Right? Am I the only one that does that? Nobody's gonna agree. Okay, sorry. But I think that that's kind of the way we look at it. But I wanna re, re help, help reshape your, your focus. I believe the Lord wants us to look at it a little different. Turn to Genesis uh, chapter three. We're gonna start in verse eight. And you know, just setting this up a little bit. Before, when, when man was in the garden with God, you know, they obviously had fellowship with him. And so it doesn't say it, but it is implied in the scripture that this is a continual thing, that God was in and out of communication with them, that they were constantly dialoguing with God, right? But the first conversation of dialogue that you actually see in scripture is right here in three, verse three, starting in verse eight. This is the first recorded prayer. Then it's funny, when I say prayer, you're like, well, wait a minute. That's not a written prayer. But what prayer is, it is dialogue. It is conversation between man and God. And here in the midst of this situation, they just messed up. They messed up so bad that we're still feeling the impacts of it today. You can't mess up any worse than that. I mean, can you? You got to understand something. Adam... When he sinned, we're we're not like him. His sin changed the courses of eternity forever. But there's one who's, who did one better. That's the second Adam. But let me read this real quick. Verse eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? I can't get away from that phrase. God says, where are you? I've heard it preached a million times and it still hit me the same way. There's something powerful about those simple words because who said it? It is God who's asking us, where are we at? He's asking Adam like he doesn't know. And they they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Then he asked, who told you you were naked? 
Did you eat from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, which was God gave him a helper. The woman you gave for me to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then he goes on to deal with the conflict at hand. And then we also know he goes on to cover them, right, with clothing, which is the first sacrifice later on you see. And then he also gives them a promise of the Messiah to come. But the point is this, this is the first dialogue. This is the first conversation that's recorded in the scripture. And this is in the worst time of their life. They've just messed up the world. But God meets them, you see? And God is right here meet to meet us. See, it's God the one who pursues us. Prayer is initiated with God, by God, for us. See, if we don't understand this, how much God wants a relationship with us, we're missing it. He wants a relationship so much that he takes sin on himself, that he separates from the Father from a time being, that he pursues us. So when you think of prayer, reframe it in your brain. God wants to spend time with me. Don't look at it as a, I got to do, but I get to do. How much time I got? One other thing I, I wanted to do last service, but I didn't get to do it, is this. John 17, if I can find it. The second Adam, Jesus Christ and his priestly prayer. You see, the thing that's so amazing, gosh, listen, we're, we're screwed up individuals. At your best, you're messed up. At my very best, well, you ever heard that said, how does it feel knowing at your very best, you can only be second best? But in this reality is, how does it feel at your very best knowing that you will never measure up on your own strength and merit to the standard that God requires? It's not possible. But Jesus, the second Adam, came to set the record straight. This is a conversation between Jesus and the Father. And I'm just going to read it. Jesus spoke these things. Look up to the heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you gave him authority over all flesh. So that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. This is the eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent. Jesus Christ, I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you because I have given them the words you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I am, that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I prayed for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given to me because they are yours. Everything. I have is yours and everything you have is mine and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name 
that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you've given me. I guarded them and not one of them were lost except the son of destruction so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in them. And I can go on. This is Jesus speaking to the Father. One last quote by Ian Bounds. It says, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better machinery, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men, and I'm going to add women, who are filled with the Holy Ghost. Men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men, through people. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men. Men and women of prayer. Inbound. Application. Application. 